Well, they showed it. That's that how I found out. They showed it, but they didn't. At that time, it should have come into my file. So at that point. Did they modify the HUD one? No, because <laughs> it expired. Oh, this it has expired. been one fun transaction. He, he says he's not, they're not going to get anything now because they didn't close prior to, to the seven. You think I work hard enough, guys? Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, you didn't do the deal, though. This, this, this it was their deal. deal. It was their side deal. And, they, and they're not getting anything now. So. That we know of. <laughs> yes. And it's still having proof. The case <laughs> is the buyer one uh, had no contingency and appeared to close, lost the job, and cannot close the deal. So they decided to back it out. Um, at the final day, even the loan dog is almost in the title. And according to your previous point so at this time buyer could not get deposited back either way he's removed all his contingencies the, 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 the okay and losing his job was not a contingency no, I, I, <laughs> right yeah okay so if he can't close then his earnest money deposit is at risk right i understand that yeah um, the, no would 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 the seller give it back maybe they got somebody in the wings you know what I would if I were, if I were representing him, what I would say is, look, this is what happened. It's unfortunate he got fired. He didn't see it coming. He had the, the, do, the loan docs are there. He obviously he's not going to be able to pay that mortgage, so why close? So it's an unfortunate situation. You could give him information and documentation to prove it, then say put it back on the market, provided you sell it for the same price or a higher price. You know maybe you just keep a portion of the deposit and give him the remainder back. He doesn't have to. But maybe he'd be a good guy and do but that. They don't have to. Yeah. The real case is they sell the sold the house right away and with even higher price. Uh, yeah, but you can't, you know, the even, even with a higher price, you can't really prove any damage. You still can keep the previous buyer's deposit. Liquidated damages. Uh -huh. But I thought you could not sell the property twice. If you did not sell no, the first of, No, they can't. It sounds like they can't sell it. They can't can sell it. Oh. Yeah. So the, the second time they sell higher, so they still don't have it. No, because the liquidated damages says you don't have to prove damages. It's an agreed upon amount between the buyer and the seller so they don't have to go through that dance of, of, of proving the damages. Okay. So they, they don't can. have to approve the damages. Now, if they didn't initial the liquidated damages, then your point is well taken. You weren't damaged, you sold them for more money. Now, to the extent that you're, you don't have the use of that money from the time I was supposed to close to the time you actually do close, maybe I'm obligated for that, that's your actual damages. But once you initial that 3%, that, oh, that whole exercise of justifying damages goes out the window, which I think from a lawyer's standpoint is really good because it quantifies it. And it says this is the amount, 3% of the purchase price. You can figure it out. If you don't, then you've got, well, you know, I had to, I had to drive my car more because I had to do something. you got all these things that may or may not be allowable, and it becomes a big mess. It costs so the, time and money. The key point is that you do not have to provide the evidence for the victim. That's absolutely right. Okay. No right. evidence. Your guys, SOL, as they say. Did you guys sign the liquidated damages? Oh, yeah, every yeah. time. Every time. Every time. Yeah. You're better off doing, you know, my recommendation is I think you're better off yeah, signing every the liquidated time. damages yeah. clause. Because you run the risk that if somebody is real damaged beyond the 3%, that could be a real hit. Can I ask a question? I have represented several clients that are attorneys, and they refuse to sign the liquidated damages. Well, lawyers, you can't get lawyers to do anything. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them not to sign it. That'll probably get them to sign it. Because they want, they want to be able to, 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 to make the seller prove the damages, and if they go to, to a lawsuit, I mean, everybody thinks this lawyer can sue it all day long on his own behalf. <laughs> yeah, but who is he paying? You know, it's money out of his pocket because he's not representing somebody else. But they, uh, a lot of people think that way. But then he runs the risk that if the seller's damages are more than 3%, that's what he's going to get stuck with. But I, I would tell Elise, I made it sign it anyways, because I told him that's okay, but there's multiple offers, and that's what the seller wants. I'll sign it. <laughs> there you go. Can I have a question? Yeah. Can just the buyer cross it after 3% and put 5% to the seller, or the buyer just cross this 3%? And the law says 3% 3, 3 is all so you can get for can. liquidated damages, okay. so don't mess with that. Um, uh, okay, we talked about that. 
Can I ask you a question yep. about um, short sales? And I think the banks are now allowing certain amounts of time, about the 60 to 90 days, that the buyers can, the owners can stay in the house. Um, but there, what kind of consequences? And uh, they always we have to sign an arm's length thing and say that there's not going to be any exchange, that the buyers, uh, the sellers, not or the owners, not receiving any compensation or anything. Sure. So. What happens if they if they make a side deal to stay longer, six months or for the seller to stay longer? Stay, yes, yeah, as long as you're not part of that. Uh, but they have to sign the arms length agreement. Everybody, all parties, including us. Well, they, uh, I, I think that's what your duty as a um, uh, a agent is much like my duty as a lawyer. I tell you, you make the decision for this. If if I tell you that you you really can't you sign an affidavit that says that you can't stay in that, that property right. any longer than what the banks agreed to, right. or that you're not having a, a, a phony baloney uh, buyer come in who's mm -hmm. going to flip it over to you right. once they buy it for a, for a lower price, which you can't do, right. you you have to explain that to your client, and if and if you have here's the here's where you really get into the problem. If you have knowledge, let's let's just, let's take the worst case scenario. Uncle Phil's going to buy the property for you because you have you owe six hundred thousand dollars. Uncle Uncle Phil's going to be able to buy it for three hundred thousand dollars. The bank's going to write off the rest. And you can't sell to a relative or a close friend or somebody that you have a relationship with. So you don't know that, and they do it, and then the bank finds out. They might try to drag you in, but you say, look, I, I had no knowledge. Once you have knowledge, then you have a problem because not only do you have to, I think, verbally explain it to your client, you may want to go that extra step and send them something in writing that says, as we discussed, Uncle Phil, pursuant to this agreement, I just found out that Uncle Phil, he is your Uncle Phil and not just Phil, is going to buy this property. Um, and uh, you know, I've told you that that's, that's not allowed. Or you know, even then, you might run for the hills if you get that information, because even though the lender's unlikely to to, dis to find out, if they do, then they become ruthless. Yeah. We had a situation where um, I'm trying to think of the name of the bank, they were just impossible. Uh, it was one of these banks that got a, deal, a sweet deal, a sweetheart deal from the government that said they couldn't lose money. I can't remember which one it was. Any, any of it. The um, the loan agent. You guys do any loans? No. Okay, I'll be real quick with this. The loan agent um, set up a phony employer for the guy to, to verify the, his employment to get the loan. And so the, the, somebody phoned a number, and the guy said, "Yeah, uh, Jose works here. Yeah, he's the foreman. He's been here for ten years, and he makes this kind of money and that kind of." Money. Closed the loan, Jose uh, gets the property, he lives in it for two years, and they default. The, le the, the lender had already sold it to, uh, I think, Freddie Mac, and Freddie did, did their own internal investigation, and they called the phone number on the file. And, and the business said, well, I don't know who the hell you're talking about, but that guy's never worked here. And so then they went back to the lender and said, you're rebuying the loan. And the lender went back to the broker and said, you're rebuying the loan. Wow. And the broker went to the agent and said, you're rebuying the loan. Wow. So you got to be real careful when you have knowledge that either you back away. Because as a lawyer, for instance, I can't lie to the court. I can vigorously uh, defend and represent my client, but I can't lie to the court. Because if they find out, that was my license. So if I get a client who's really a little bit uh, sketchy, I just basically, I got, I got to walk away. If you get a client who's telling you they're going to do stuff that you know is not right, mm -hmm. and you may want to think about walking away. If it's too late to walk away because the deal's already done, then they told you, then you might want to put something in writing in case somebody ever looks. You got something at least. So I have a question on a short sale right now. It's a Bank of America short sale, a cooperative short sale. Uh, they have agreed to do that. Sellers have agreed to do the short sale. Offers comes in. The seller wants more time to stay in the property. Meaning, more than the bank's willing to give. Well, the bank's not giving any time. Okay. Ninety days, supposedly, is the most. Well, I mean, and that's okay. So the, the buyer's willing to allow the short the sale. I have not discussed this with 
with Bank of America as far as they have an incentive for the seller. You do the short sale, you do this, this, and this, and then at the end, we have an incentive for you for doing the short sale. And like a cash for keys deal? Something like that. So, Does it have a prohibition for the seller remaining in the property after the close of escrow? Uh, it does say, yes, there is an affidavit that but that's what, talking about. right, that comes out as we get into an offer and stuff. Now, there are a couple of offers. One, it's uh, all cash, and we'll allow, they have a separate addendum that will allow the seller to stay there through December. There's another one may allow six months. I don't want to be part of that just because I don't, I mean, I haven't discussed this with Bank of America. I don't. No way, you know. So, so, so basically, what happened is the seller went to see a real estate attorney to to find out because he knew he was going to have a church sale, and the real estate attorney told him that by law, if the if the person who buys the house is buying it with the intention as an owner occupied, the most you get is sixty days, and in sixty days that person has to occupy the property. If he's an investor, in the church sale, the bank allows ninety days. However. There is a form that the attorneys can put in petition to the bank if it's an investor and the investors, and if he's not related to the seller, and the investor's aim is to rent it for investing money, and that then he probably could file an extension with the bank and get that extension. So well, yeah, if the bank knows about it and agrees to it, there's no, there's no risk. Yeah, and so, and so basically he wants to go to his attorney to petition for this form with an investor. He sure. wants an investor so he could stay there. But, um, so what is my responsibility? Uh, I think you have to. I think you have to point out what you're telling me to the bank. That the bank. Well, you know, first of all, I think you have to say to your client. That here's what the bank document says. This is the affidavit that you're signing under penalty of perjury, which could be a jail sentence if they wanted to push it. If you're lying to the bank by getting this, whatever the bank is giving. Right. So if you want more time, because this investor is willing to allow you the, more time than the bank says you can have in the affidavit, then you got to go back to the bank and get permission, if you solve that problem with the bank saying, okay, we agree under this circumstance you can do it, you're clear. Right. If you don't, then I think you have to say something in writing to your client saying, I I've advised you. These are these are the sort of tricky letters that I have some problems with sometimes when I have to write them to my client. <laughs> I've told you this, you've decided to do that. I just wanted to tell you that's against my advice because if you screw it up, I don't want you coming back to me and say, you didn't tell me. Because the oral art, or oral agreement that you have with your client, I, I tell you, the client's going to have an okay. amnesia <laughs> when, when, mm -hmm. uh, when there's a problem. You never told me that. So if you put it in writing then and send it to them in an email, it can be friendly. It doesn't have right. to be, right. you know, right. brutally. Hey, so I, he's able to get the permission to his attorney for an extension. Sure, you're done. You're, we're done. We're yeah. done. So his attorney, but the bank, the Bank of America that holds its loan has to agree to it. Oh yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's what he wants to do. Because you're trying to modify that uh, that affidavit. Yes. Okay. Okay. That's good. Okay. That's a good way to handle it then. Uh, yeah. Let's see. Title investing. We kind of covered that. Time periods. Yeah. Be careful with your time periods, especially the ones that need uh, financing. You know, a lot of the financing stuff I, I used to see, I haven't seen a bunch of it recently, but you know, you have a letter from a broker that says, you know, Joe Schmo is qualified to, uh, for a $400,000 loan. You haven't done a damn thing, and they haven't got a bank that agreed to any of that. So they just send out the, the broker letter. Well, that isn't worth the, the, the paper it's written on. So you, you got to make sure that where your client is in the, in the food chain with regard to uh, looking for a loan and how much he's been qualified to have and poke around a little bit. Because if you say it's going to be 17 days and it, it's going to take 25 days, then why why say 17 when you know you're going to ask for additional time up front? So if he's only gotten the, the broker phony baloney letter, you're probably not going to have enough time. What are we looking at in the contract? What I was looking, I was just doing uh, time periods. Time, I'm time. on page um, yeah, five. Time time time. Yeah. Um, and then this, this whole, this, if you haven't read this, and I know this is dense reading for most people, but if you haven't read the whole time period of how this thing works, <coughs> my advice is to read it and to know how it works, to understand. <coughs> I've had these cases. 17 days to remove all contingencies. 17 days goes by, nobody says anything. Everybody's rocking right along. 
That contract stays just where it is. Nothing's going on. You're still in contract, and and it'll go on there till perpetuity, if no one says anything. So when that 17 days is up, if you're the listing agent, you got to say, okay, now what do we do? Can we give them a notice to perform, or we're just going to let it hang out there? Or are we going to give them an addendum for more time? Don't just let those time periods fly by and don't do anything because the contract is still there. Nothing so is going on. It's not an expired contract. It's still there. Excuse me? It's not an expired contract and it's still there. Absolutely. I'm glad I'm not. The way this thing is written, somebody has to take a, a, a step. 17 days. 17 days, just go put your feet up and don't worry about it. On the 18th day, you should have it calendared to see where those contingency removals are. If not, you give the notice to perform. Then they don't perform within that 48 hour period. Then you give notice of cancellation if you want to be aggressive. But, but just to let it sit out there, because then your client's going to say, my God, it's been almost a month. What happened? Yeah. What happened? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I don't know. So the, so, the, so the notice to perform should be 48 hours then not 24. You can get 24. I, I think you, I, I'd have to look at what the notices say. I think you can get 24. Okay. Well, so wait a second. What does this contract say? I think this one, I think this form contract, which could probably be modified, I thought it said. It says two days. It, said, um, two days it says two days or blank days. So you could, you could change the two days to one day. Two days or one day. If you think two days is too generous. But read that, and so know how it works, because no, you're going to be, you are going to be. Sorry, it says whichever occurs last, two days or whatever, which, whichever occurs last. So, so then that days. means two days, no matter what then, right? Yeah. Okay, whichever, or longer. Right. Okay. So or, or, or until the time specified in the applicable paragraph. Right. Yeah, okay. Right. If you guys get familiar with that, you're going to be ahead of about 75% of the uh, uh, real estate agents out there and brokers who don't know how this works. And this is how you protect your client. And if you're the selling agent and the, the listing agent doesn't bother you, it bums the word. Right. Don't say anything. Right. Right. Yeah, let them push you. You but should if you're be, the listing agent and the buyer's you be not pushing. performing, you better go out there and push them. Because your button. client's going to be really unhappy right. if they decide to read this thing and say, wait a second, right. you gave them 17 days and it's 30 days. What are you doing? Right. Then what are you going to say? Right. You can't okay. make the decision yeah. to give them 13 more days without talking to your client. Right. You jump on it. You call your, your client on the 18th day and you say, okay, 17 days are over. You want me to give them notice to perform? Yes, I'm going to send it over right now. You're on top of it. You look like you know what you're doing. I mean, so many agents that I talk to are just, they, their eyes glaze over when I talk about this stuff because they don't know how it works. It's not that complicated. But you don't have the unilateral right at any time under this contract to just say, that's it, I'm terminating. It can't, it can't work that way. A lot of people would like it to work that way, but it doesn't. You got to give them the option, you got to point out where you, where you screwed up and give them a chance. And, and I tell you, when judges read this stuff and they say, well, did you do that? Well, no, I didn't. Well. They're going, to, they're going to read this literally. See, right. if you, because a contract is supposed to be, there's a, there's a covenant of good faith and fair dealing in every contract entered into in the state of California. That's the law. Covenant of good faith and fair dealing. That you're going to treat somebody like you'd like to be treated, and you're going to try to make that contract work. So you can't jump on somebody and say, it's the, it's the 17th day, I'm sorry I'm terminating the contract. You're not acting in good faith. You didn't. Obviously, they can read the contract same as you, but you didn't tell them you haven't removed that contingency. I'm going to give you two days to do it. I'm giving you another chance, basically, is what you're saying. That's fair. This is a multi-million dollar contract sometimes, half a million dollar contract, big ticket items. You know, you don't have the right just to unilaterally cut somebody off at the knees, and it won't work, and it won't hold up in court. Um, uh, NDP may not be delivered any earlier than two days prior to the expiration of the applicable time for buyer to move. Where, where are you? I'm still on three, so C3. Because then it says right after at least two or blank days, it says it may not be delivered any earlier than two days prior to the expiration of the applicable time for buyer to move and share cancel this agreement. I mean, obligations specified in 14C2. So, does that 
mean that you can't by one day. Seventeen days is not. Well, this is talking about. I think prior to. So let's just say you were to move. Uh, maybe you on the fifteen days, or is it after? It doesn't say anything. Well, it says you can't deliver. You can't deliver it anymore. Contingency removals, but seventeen. So you could deliver it on the 15th day saying, saying the that if you don't remove it, then you, you, on the 19th day, we can send you a notice you can't send but, you can't lower, you can't, you can't reduce the amount you've already given them. Yeah, you've given them 17, days, but you can, you can pre tell them, we're going to con cancel this contract two days after that 17 day period. You sort of get a jump on it, but you can't, you can't lessen the 70, 17 day right. period. That's you right. can lessen the two right. days. Even yes. Though it says yes. No, you can it's lessen the two days. Okay. He's just said you can't. Just, no, it just says here that any may not be okay. delivered. Any you can deliver this prior. on okay. the fifteen yes. days and giving them till the okay. seventeen days. To I get it. No, he's saying you can't. He's saying you have to have two days after the seventeenth. Even if you deliver no, on the fifteenth. No, no, you can deliver on the fifteenth. Sure, but you, but you, can't you still have to give him four days. That's what he said. Oh, you got to give him four days. Yes. Because okay. he has to have two days. That's where But okay, so can you on the eighteenth day? Give them one. I think so. Okay. Right. Let's talk but about. How come he says in here that the form can never be less than two days? No, it says it is or, not on the eighteenth. You can't give them one day. It says give buyer at least two days after delivery. Two days after delivery. Okay. Or more. No, That's what he says. After delivery, delivery of the notice to perform. Right, right. You know, after the delivery, it's two days. So yes. Whenever you choose to deliver, it's two days. The form has to have forty-eight hours, basically. I think your practice ought to be when the 17th day, if it's yeah. the 17th day, send out the uh, send out the give notice the, and give the, two days. Two days. Yeah. Because yeah. you're really not you're really not acting. You're never really not uh, doing anybody any favors by trying to Cash. hurry the process. Right. Your job is to close his escrow and get paid. Yes. So all you're doing here is just keeping somebody's feet to the fire, keeping your clients out of trouble. If the thing sort of wanders out there, right. I've seen contracts wander out for months and months, and nobody does anything. And they find out what they've done. They say, you know, you got a real problem here. You didn't, you didn't send the notices. Yes, and I'm looking the or. So it could be two days or more, but not two days or less. Right. Or right. That's right. my point. That's so right. Rather, that's right. Within the 48 hours, the basically, yes. form. Mm -hmm. and you follow up with the cancellation. Those form. cancellation. Right. But what's that mean? He doesn't sign. It. Well, that's 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 where you get into um, usually when the attorneys get involved. Because if you can't make them, obviously you can't make them sign. If they if they don't sign and and uh, remove their uh, and allow the seller to keep the um, uh, the man to close escrow, yeah. I'll, I'll let you interpret that because I I can't read it. <laughs> okay, let me finish with the question. Yeah. If you um, if they don't sign the notice of cancellation, which usually says their deposit goes to the seller, right. not always. But what's happened when the deposit goes to a seller, but the title company has to release the most part of it to sign it. Yes. But he doesn't sign it. Right. And the title company is not going to release it. Then the you're going to get into the next part that I'm going to talk about, which okay. is mediation and arbitration. Let's see what this says. Demand to close escrow. It's the form uh, yeah. DCE. DCE. Seller hereby demands that buyer close escrow on the property checkbox within three or checkbox blank days after receipt of this demand to close escrow, but no earlier than the agreed upon close of escrow date. Well, obviously, right. it's only gets served until, um, okay. uh, or by blank date, which is at least three days after receipt of this demand to close escrow, but no earlier than the agreed upon close of escrow date. So you can, I think you can plug in the, the date, um, three. I, I would say two would probably be fair. The, 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 the more you try to, to squeeze it into a, a real small box, the more a judge might say, well, how's anybody going to do that? You, 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 you sent them this thing on Friday, and it doesn't say business days, and ask them to close uh, in one day. Who's the hell's closing on Saturday? You know, it's not going to happen. So you got you got to be sensitive to that. What I'd like you all to, to think about is think a little bit like a lawyer. Uh, not to practice law, but think about what what you would think if some if you got that from somebody else. You got to close on Saturday, or you got to close on Sunday. That's not fair. That's not right. And the, the lawyer is going to beat you up on the other side when you get into litigation because they're going to say, "How do you expect the title company to open up? Just open up for you on that day, and the lender's supposed to stay open on a Saturday and fund your loan? Not going to work." So you got to be reasonable. 
because this, if it, if it, if it, somebody's looking at this in retrospect, you've got to be able to, to to argue why it was reasonable and why you did what you did. And if you can't, and it looks like you were trying to be unreasonable, like my guy that called me yesterday and say it's supposed to close on Thursday, I want to cancel on Friday. It's not going to. You can, you can give it a shot, but it's not going to work. Talk to your real estate agent; he'll tell you, or she'll tell you, that it's not going to work. So as long as you're reasonable, then you're, you're on safe ground. Um, mediation. Uh, these contracts require you to go to mediation. Period. People want to argue me, argue with me all the time. I'm going to arbitration. No, you're not. You have to mediate first. Now, if you and the other side agree that mediation is a waste of time because both of you are so unreasonable you couldn't agree on the time of day, you can stipulate to waive it. But if you go to mediate, if you don't go to mediation first, and here's what you have to understand, this is what you have to explain to your client. Let's say your client says, I'm not mediating, I want my lawyer to file a lawsuit. And if he's not a real estate attorney, he might. Or I want arbitration, um, and I want to go straight to arbitration. This mediation paragraph, if you read it, says, if you refuse to go to mediation, and you're the prevailing party, the winning party, in arbitration or in a lawsuit, you don't get your attorney's fees and cost. What's driving the truck in mediation and, arbit and litigation is the attorney's fees. So many cases are not worth pursuing because the attorney's fees are going to eat you alive. And you can't run the risk that you're going to lose. Because think about this, you got a $50,000 case and it's going to cost you $35,000 for your attorney. So if you lose, you lose 50, 35, 35, the other attorney, attorney's fees. Big number now. It's what I always explain to my clients. Think long and hard before you pull the plug. I usually will not take a case that's really that small because I know nobody's going to be happy at the end. Because if you lose, you're going to think, think you really got screwed. And if you win, you're going to say, but I have to turn around and pay you 30. Now all I get is 50. Well, why am I doing this? So you can't go, you can't go to arbitration or litigation if you didn't initial the arbitration clause until you go to mediation first because you run the risk that you run up against this last sentence that says if you refuse and, uh, to go to mediation, you don't get your, your attorney's fees. And I've, I've said to many attorney, you filed a lawsuit, have you read the contract? No, you know, they, they, they become belligerent. I said, Read this paragraph and call me back. What paragraph is that? It's mediation paragraph 26A. Um, if a party, uh, if any party commences an action without first attempting to resolve the matter through mediation or before commencement of an action refuses to mediate, after re a request has been made, then that party shall not be entitled to recover, recover attorney's fees, even if they would otherwise be available to that party in any such action, which means you won, you don't get your attorney's fees. That's what's driving this, this train in litigation is the attorney's fees. That's the risk that you have hanging over your head. And if you've given it away to begin with, by refusing to mediate, you've already put your client in a situation that's untenable for them. And so usually when I call the attorneys, they say, oh yeah, you're right, let's mediate. And I'm fine, it's, that's fine. Most cases settle in mediation. I have a great believer in mediation, especially for smaller cases, because the judge or whoever the mediator is gonna say what I just told you. And then the client's gonna say, well, I'm not doing that. It's too big a risk. It's like putting my house on red in Las Vegas. You know, if I win, that's great. If I lose, I don't have a house. I'm not gonna do that. Arbitration. Um, people have gone back and forth on whether you ought, ought to uh, sign the arbitration provision. I, I, I used to be really bullish on it, and then I still like it, but here, here's the problem. The way the arbitrations work, if the judge makes the decision in arbitration and the judge is just flat out of his mind, he's made a huge mistake, then your chance of appealing it and, and, and winning not zero, but pretty darn close. So you run the risk, and if you go into litigation and, and, the, and the judge screws up, you can appeal it. 
Now, of course, you, you, can, you can say whatever you want to say. That's expensive. But in arbitration, you're, probably, you're not going to get a, a chance at an appeal. So if the judge misinterprets the law, doesn't know what he's doing, I just had an arbitration that I won. I thought I had a 50% chance. The other attorney is so mad because he thinks the judge screwed up. I don't think the judge screwed up. I think my client was a horrible witness, but I don't think the judge screwed up. I think the judge understood the law. But he's mad because he can't, he can't uh, appeal it. He threatened to appeal it. And I said, knock yourself out and you're not going to win. Um, so he decided, uh, after looking at it, he wasn't going to be able to prevail. But that's the only issue that you might have with arbitration, is that if the judge screws up, you're probably going to be stuck with it. That's why when I go to arbitration, I want a, I want a judge to be my arbitrator. I don't want Joe Schmutz, uh, the attorney. I want the judge because he's probably tried a million cases and been around for a long time. It's unlikely he's going to make such a huge mistake that it would cost you the case. So I do like arbitration, but it just depends on who the arbitrator is. So you would a lot of want times, to do arbitration because you want a judge to have the higher side. Well, I think, I think this does not say that you have to use a, um, the arbitrator shall be a retired judge or justice or an attorney with at least five years of residential real estate law experience, unless the parties mutually agree to a different arbitrator. A lot of times I get in these situations where people are really looking at cost. A, a retired judge is going to cost you anywhere from $450 to $700 an hour. Uh, a, 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 an attorney is probably going to cost you $350, maybe $4 max. So if you're looking price-wise, the cheapest obviously is the attorney, but I don't want to use an attorney. I want to be able to say to my client, this guy was a judge, 30 years on the bench. So you get what you pay for. <laughs> Good point. So I'm, I, I would be worried about that because if for some reason something happens, because your clients always think that you know everything. So if it doesn't go their way, it's got to be your fault, right? <laughs> you, you, you got the same thing with your clients and selling real estate. And it's sort of the same thing with me. So I like retired judges and I use them all the time and I think they're worth their money. So who picked up the, uh, the arbitrator? Is both the attorney? You have to agree. Uh, yeah. If you don't agree, then you have to file a lawsuit in Superior Court, and a judge in Superior Court will choose. And I'll tell you who he's going to choose. He's going to choose one of his buddies who's retired, who's an arbitrator. <laughs> That's exactly the way it's going to work. I, I thought there's a panel, probably five people. There, here, there's a Judicial Arbitration and Mediation Services, also known as JAMS. There's the AAA, American Arbitration Association. There is another one that I've used, and I can't remember their name. Mediation, the Mediation Masters this year, and then there's a, this is a cottage industry for retired attorneys and, and uh, for judges, and I think JAMS tends to be the most expensive, but they also have a really, really rich panel of, of judges, I mean, really smart judges, very accomplished judges, judges around the Court of Appeal, and that sort of thing, and you get some really smart, smart people, and that's what you want. You want somebody fair and smart. And then you take the chances. And if you, if you can argue well in front of your, for your client, then you have a half a fighting chance. If you get somebody who doesn't understand stuff, like a lot of attorneys don't understand real estate. They think they do until they get in the middle of one of these cases. I have one right now. That I don't know why we're going to arbitration. It was a non-disclosure issue. And I guess I, can, I won't tell you the client's names, but my client had a 100-year-old 100, 100 Victorian house in San Francisco that sits on a hill like this. Never lived in the house, owned it for about 20 years. Sold it to this couple from uh, back east. The people did all their inspections, bought the house, closed escrow, and then they said, um, after close of escrow, the foundation is failing. And they said, you knew about the foundation failing, and so we're suing you to have you replace the foundation. Well, my original thought was, how can you buy a 100-year-old house in San Francisco on a hill and not have a foundation inspection? What are you thinking? They don't see that. Because we already had a mediation. They, don't, they just don't see that. They can't see it. They won't see it. So we're going to have an arbitration. And I, um, I don't see how they win the case. I really don't. If the seller didn't know, and you had every opportunity to do whatever inspection known to man, and there's stuff in the reports that would lead a reasonable person to say, you know, the, the garage floor is not level. How come the garage floor is not level? I mean, I'm not a scientist, but there must be something wrong with the foundation. 
and there's stuff in the termite report that says that the, the, the foundation shows some crumbling. Oh, Hello? Yeah. Hello? Red flag. Yeah. <laughs> These guys, I don't think, know real estate. So they're going to they're gonna learn, I guess, the hard way. But you shouldn't be, as a lawyer, you shouldn't be in some avenue uh, or area of the law that you don't understand because you're, you don't so, know what you don't know. So you actually took the case to mediation? And what happened at mediation? Mediation, well, unfortunately, you know, my client is um, a, uh, a recent amputee. She lost her leg to um, diabetes. She's 90 years old. Oh. And she got pissed off at, after about 25 minutes because the, instead of the mediator trying to explain, I already explained stuff to her, but she didn't know the mediator from you know, the guy at the gas station. So he came in and he took one of these white boards and he said, they want $125,000, but I think I can get them down to 85. Uh -huh. She so looked at me and said, why the hell am I paying them anything? And I said, well, I don't think you ought to pay them anything, but I don't think you ought to pay me $50,000 to defend the stupid thing. Yeah. Maybe if you gave them something, we could convince them that they don't really have a case, and you gave them something, we could get rid of it. He lost her as soon as he put a number on the board and acted like he was doing her a favor because he could get them to lower the 125 to 85. That was not the way to do it. And he wouldn't, it wouldn't set well with any of you, and it didn't set well with a 90-year-old woman no, who was irritated to be there to begin with. So she said, I'm going home. Well, why do you need a situation? <laughs> That's exactly what she said. I said, you can't go home. Yeah. She said, I'm going home. Yeah. You well, going with me or not? Yeah. Well, in this situation, is about coming back to Suda. <laughs> My point in the mediation was, you guys, you, you guys should be looking at your agent. And they said, no, we really like our agent. <laughs> so that the, my arbitration is going to be the, the guy that's not there is the one I'm going to be pointing to for my two or three day so trial. Their agent didn't show up. He doesn't have to because he's not a party to the contract. So he can't. We can't force him into arbitration. That's right. But I've got an expert witness already lined up who's going to going to testify that this guy screwed up. He should know better, and he should.